technology projects. Um, historically, we've done a lot of work in the virtualization space. We got a lot of experience with OpenStack, OpenShift, and now, you know, as you said, uh, this new very interesting and exciting topic, OpenShift virtualization. Awesome. And for the audience out there, sorry, I did not hit uh, the actual transition button fast enough. So my intro was completely skipped, but luckily Reese's was probably mostly there. So just a fresh reminder, I'm Chris Short, uh, technical marketing manager. Reese Oxenham is joining us today. Uh, you just caught his intro. And also Andrew Sullivan, my fellow teammate. Uh, are we wearing the same shirt today? Possibly. Is it uh, the... No, no. no. Just, just red. Okay. Mine's the red. collaborative right. to the core. Yes. Well, okay. Well, I'm the odd one out. So. Well, where's my red shirt? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'll send you one. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm just here for moral support for for Reese. Um, he, he certainly doesn't need my help with anything technical. Um, uh, Reese is uh, incredibly good at this stuff, and uh, I'm blown away by the script and everything that he's created, which I hope he walks through a little bit of um, today for creating the nested uh, OpenShift Virtualization Lab. Uh, appreciate it, Andrew, but uh, let's save the praise for when the demos work. Uh, I built this cluster about an hour ago. I That's haven't fun. really tested it thoroughly before we run through this. So I wanted a completely fresh, clean cluster. Um, so hopefully everything will uh, will work out just fine. If it doesn't work, we'll just say it's not your fault. It's OpenShift's fault or I don't know. Yeah. We'll, we'll it's also it on beta, the fact that it's an hour right? We old, haven't launched right? this yet. There you go. It's because it's end beta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, this is a fresh OpenShift 4.4 cluster. You know, OpenShift 4.4 was only just made available very, very recently. Um, so it is just a completely fresh uh, environment. Um, it is actually all running on this one machine. Um, so it Whoa. is, yeah, it, it, all of these machines are completely virtualized. Um, but it's just because it's much easier for me to, you know, build up uh, demos and, and, and labs and things when it's running on, on, on my system here. I've got plenty of resources available to me. So, I mean, what we got, hopefully this is coming through okay. I've just got five mm -hmm. systems here. Just three masters, sort of standard, highly available configuration, and two workers. Now, um, for those of you that don't know what uh, OpenShift virtualization is, you can kind of think of it as merely a feature or an extension of OpenShift Container Platform to run virtual machines. So we're kind of delivering on the notion of a single platform to run both of them simultaneously. So you can have sets of nodes that run containers and virtual machines side by side, all orchestrated with the same APIs, all running on the same hardware, all utilizing the same networking backends, the same storage backends. So you're no longer having to maintain multiple silos of technology just to do you know, virtual machines and containerization. So we're really trying to deliver on this with, uh, with OpenShift virtualization. And uh, what I'm showing you today is um, OpenShift virtualization 2.3. We're going to go through an actual deployment of that. We're going to set down some networking, some storage configurations. We're going to deploy some virtual machines, and we can we can poke around the API and uh, what you can currently see on on the UI. But just to point out, we are very much still in beta with um, uh, with OpenShift virtualization. We announced it last week at the at the Red Hat Virtual Summit, um, and uh, it is available to to. to play around with today. You know, anyone can go and do what I'm doing today, uh, but it's not currently supported um, from uh, from Red Hat, but, but we hope to have that uh, that very soon. Keep me honest here, Andrew. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> True moral right. support. I just, know, to be right? clear, just to be clear to everybody <laughs> listening out there, right? Like this is not like something like you have to add in, like this is going to be baked in to mm -hmm. OpenShift, right? Like it's yeah, an OpenShift container platform. It's an OpenShift Kubernetes engine. It's going to be there for everyone to use. Correct. It's not like it's, um, you know, as you say, Chris, you don't have to deploy any additional hardware um, or, or indeed, you know, make any drastic changes to your environment. It's, it's an opt-in. If you want to use virtual machines alongside your existing infrastructure, you simply enable the extension. Now, I um, just want to rewind a little bit. When I said no additional hardware, to run 
virtual machines on top of OpenShift, we really do recommend you use it on top of bare metal for obvious reasons. Right. Inside of this environment, which I'm showing you here, I'm doing nested virtualization. This works just fine in a demo, in a sort of lab environment, but it, it's not recommended, nor will it likely be supported for any production usage. So um, if you don't already have bare metal OpenShift inside of your environment, then um, we would very much encourage you if you wanted to take a look at leveraging OpenShift virtualization, or indeed, as you'll see it in a few different places, uh, CNV or container native virtualization, um, then we would recommend you, you attach bare metal machines to your cluster to do so, or indeed deploy a dedicated bare metal cluster for, uh, for such uh, uh, utilization. So can I, can I pause for a second and ask you a couple of questions there? Sure. Um, so uh, there's a lot of questions that come up um, internally, both you know just internal folks asking as well as asking on behalf of customers around mixing cluster node types. Mm -hmm. um, so it is fully supported to have a virtual control plane and physical worker nodes. The caveat being you can't deploy using UPI or IPI. It's the quote unquote bare metal installation method. Um, so yeah. does that... And does that hold true with OpenShift virtualization as well? It does. So um, just to add a bit of color around some of the terms that you use there, um, the new OpenShift installer for version 4 and above, um, we've really worked on what we call platform integration. The idea here is that you run the OpenShift installer binary. It asks you a few different questions around where you want to deploy your cluster. Do you want it to run on Amazon? Do you want it to run on um, OpenStack? Do you want it to run on VMware or whatever it might be? You answer some questions, away it goes. It deploys all of the infrastructure, gets it all up and running, but crucially ties in some of the underlying platform integration. So that if you tell OpenShift, oh, you know, I want new worker nodes, it will connect into those APIs, provision it, and away it goes. One of the big things we're currently working on is to get that same capability for bare metal as well. So this is commonly referred to as bare metal um, IPI, installer provisioned infrastructure. So the idea is that if you want to do things like scaling or you want to provision OpenShift all the way from bare metal right to a running cluster, you can do that. An OpenShift installer will provide you the ability to, to do that. The problem with this configuration when it comes to the you know the original question about having mixed clusters is it's kind of assumed that all of the either the entire cluster is of one type. So if you start running off, you know, working on top of, of OpenStack, that it's always all of your worker nodes and all of your infrastructure will always be on OpenStack. And the same with regards to you know running on VMware or running you know on bare metal or something like that. So what tends to happen is if you want to break from that mold. There might be a little bit of handcrafting or manual deployment of some of those bare metal machines, because realistically, the OpenShift installer was set up and is originally configured to deploy against one particular type of infrastructure. So it is possible and it is supported. And the caveat that you said, Andrew, is, is, is absolutely right. It just requires a little bit more um, manual steps to get some of those bare metal workers up and running. Although it, I, you know it's fully documented to, 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 to get it set up, but it's not part of the actual installer today. Yeah, and I also want to point out that, so UPI specifically doesn't necessarily work because, so I'll pick on vSphere. Um, so with the vSphere UPI installer, it deploys the dynamic storage provisioner, mm -hmm. which isn't going to work with a bare metal node. Uh, so yeah, you, you have to take that into account, right? Of we, Yes, you can work around that by doing some careful, you know, labels and, and uh, and or taints and tolerations, et cetera, so that you only have VMs with a, you know, uh, dynamically provisioned PV from that storage platform on those nodes, right? That type of stuff. But that's an awful lot of stuff to track. And, and you know, if it goes wrong, it's, you know, a hassle and all of that other stuff. So from, uh, you know, the Red Hat perspective, it's, you know, no, just always use the bare metal, no integration installation method if you're going to mix uh, node types. Yeah, absolutely agreed. All right, so um, let's go ahead and show how easy it is to get um, OpenShift virtualization up and running. And aside from you know, one of the greatest things about OpenShift 4 being the platform integration, one of the sort of next 
the best thing is um, some of the integration work of operators and how operators make the deployment and the lifecycle management of additional tools, components, features, and you know value add software much much more powerful. Um, so it's kind of handing over the knowledge of how to manage and manage the life cycle of those directly to Kubernetes and therefore um, OpenShift. So it's incredibly powerful. And we've done the exact same thing with um, with uh, OpenShift virtualization. So turning this on is literally as easy as deploying an, a new operator. So um, you go into operators and the uh, operator hub. And this is a list of all the various different um, components that you can deploy as, uh, as, as part of, of OpenShift. Um, or with you know, varying different um, methods for you know depending on where where it came from. Some are provided as you know community open source bits. Some of course require additional licenses and things from the respective vendors. But um, all I'm going to do here is just search for virtual virtualization. And you can see here we have container native virtualization or indeed um, OpenShift virtualization as it will be called in the final product. And you can see here it has a particular version 2.3 and it has what we call capability levels. So um, operators have various different levels of um, sort of feature support and maturity. So some it literally can just do a basic install. Some operators have the ability to do rolling upgrades. So if you start off on, say, 2.3, we, we add this as part of our cluster, and 2.4 comes out in a few months, the operator that you've already installed can manage its own upgrade path. So it will get you to that next version without you as a, an end user or you as an OpenShift administrator having to worry about how do I do all of that? How do I get that back up and running? You have things like full life cycle, so you know, scaling, um, you know, both up and down and recovery from from uh, you know potential errors and, and, and fault tolerance and things as well and then there's some additional things uh, you know getting some more metrics and insights into what's going on inside of the environment but you know we, we, we're pretty mature on the on the 2.3 version of uh, openshift virtualization here and you know as i said this is um fully available as part of um openshift uh, 4.4 um you can install it on older versions, of course, but I'm just saying this is this is now fully available at, through the marketplace um, as as, as two point three. But I just want to, if if any any anyone's joined since we since we started this, this is not fully supported from Red Hat yet. It still very much is in the sort of technology preview slash beta um, realm. So I'm just going to hit install. And it's going to say, well, which which channel do I want? Uh, 2.3. Um, it's going to put it in a specific namespace for me called OpenShift CNV. Uh, approval strategy, I'm just going to leave that as uh, automatic. And I'm going to hit subscribe to that. Now what's going to happen is it's going to go ahead and it's going to deploy some additional components um, for me. It's going to lay down the operator um, that I, that I uh, wanted it to do. So here you can see install is ready. So I'm going to go into here. And now what I've done is I've just I've simply deployed this operator. What I'm going to need to do now is create a new instance of, uh, of, of the um, of, for, for the deployment of the hyperconverged operator. So I hit create instance. It's going to ask me for some additional component, additional questions based on the sort of YAML file here. Bare metal platform I'll leave as, as false because I'm doing nested virtualization here. And I'm going to hit create. Now, what this is going to do is going to deploy all of the pods that I need. So all these these are all the services that provide me with all of the API capabilities. Here you can see uh, it's probably going a little bit too fast. If I change this, can I can I interrupt you for a second, Reese? Yeah, so of course. If you go back to the uh, to the operator, the installed operators, and look at the CRDs that are inside of there. So one of the new things with uh, OpenShift 4.4 is you notice how much less crowded the screen is. It used to have all of the CRDs listed in there. Uh, now it only shows the the important or the critical ones inside of there, um, which is super convenient from a, an administrator perspective of I only have to see the things that are actually important, um, although I can dig in and I can find all of the other ones if I want. Yeah, absolutely. So now um, all being um, good, you're going to see all of these pods then eventually running. Um, so these are all of the, the respective um, services that I need to then go ahead and provision virtual machines on top of my OpenShift um, infrastructure. So you've got, you know, controllers, you've got bridge markers that enable you to do things like bridge networking, um, 
various different components around um, CDI, which is about uh, importing data. So you have existing disk images you want to use for your virtual machines. It'll go ahead and do that. Um, host path, if you want to use some local storage. Um, CNI, so you can actually you know, get your networking into that um, as well. There's NM state, which we're going to go into in more detail. This is a really cool operator that allows you to set out your networking configuration through Network Manager directly through um, OpenShift. So if you want to make a, uh, changes to bridges on the underlying infrastructure to support your virtual machines, you can absolutely go ahead and do that through here as well. And there's, there's lots of various, various other uh, uh, bits and bobs that we have here. Um, to help us uh, with that. So all of those pods are now looking like they're running and well, just a, a couple are, are likely still uh, still going ahead. Uh, this Qubit node labeler, uh, if these are the last ones, yeah, these are the last ones that, that, that are going to be uh, going to be running here. These are just looking at my nodes that are available for uh, to make sure that they're capable of running virtual machines. So you're going to see that, for example, um, I've got some machines in my environment, the masters that aren't schedulable. So it's not going to be able to run virtual machines there. Only my workers can. So it's going to bring these machines up, check that it has dev KVM in there so I can actually do uh, vir virtual machines. And then we should be relatively uh, good to go. But you'll see on the left-hand side, you know, this is dynamically changed. I now have a new entry for virtual machines. No virtual machines found, so you know we can do a, a bunch of things uh, with this as well. So there's um, new with wizard, um, so it'll run you through, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail shortly, where it's going to ask us a bunch of questions about my virtual machine. We can import, so if you have an existing, you know, say VMware cluster that you want to pull virtual machines from, you can do it directly through this, or you can just go straight to YAML. You know, you're an expert in in OpenShift and Kubernetes, and you want to copy and paste your uh, your YAML into there directly. You can go ahead um, and and, and do so. But I just want to make sure that this deployment has uh, gone ahead successfully first. So I think that they're all running. Yep. So every pod is running here. We don't have anything in pending terminating or failed or anything like that. So I'm confident that my uh, OpenShift cluster is working um, just fine. Now on the terminal side as well, um, let me just check I'm logged in. Yep. I'm logged in here. You'll also see that um, we now have some additional um, uh, API resources and custom resource definitions that we can use directly from the command line as well. So I can do OC get VM, no resources, but in, that's, uh, you know, it's proven just by doing that, that it understands what that VM resource is instead of saying that it doesn't understand what that resource is. There's VM, there's also VMI for, for uh, instance. You can define a VM that has multiple counts like you, you used to be able to do um, in, in OpenStack um, as well. So um, now that OpenShift virtualization is deployed, you know I think that was literally three or four clicks to, to enable that particular feature directly through the operator hub. And I have this, this ability to do it by the CLI and the API. I need to make some additional, very minor changes inside of my environment to support the running of virtual machines, namely um, around um, uh, networking and storage. So. The first thing I want to do is I want to set up my networking. Now, by default, OpenShift virtualization supports out-of-the-box pod networking. So just like your your uh, your containers, you know, they will be essentially on a masqueraded-based um, uh, implementation. So they hide behind a, a NATed interface. You can create routes to them. You know, you can um, use all the various different standard OpenShift networking capabilities directly for your virtual machines. But for a lot of cases, that model that works for containers doesn't always fit for virtual machines. Sometimes you might want to enable, you know, a direct network attachment of your virtual machines onto existing networks. That can be over something like a bridge, or it can be over SRIOV, or indeed, as we're working on uh, within the engineering departments, a lot more of the fast data path stuff. Um, so we need to basically make a, a small modification inside of this environment to suit my needs. I want to demonstrate that I can attach a virtual machine directly to a, you know, a data center network that I have, um, you know, well, <laughs> I say a data center network, it's a network that's on, on my, uh, on my physical machine, but it'll, it'll enable me to, you know, secure shell directly to that machine without having to go through the OpenShift uh, networking. Uh, implementation as well. Yeah, and, and I want to point out that so the the pod network will work just fine, right? The oh, VM yeah. when, when the when the VM gets deployed, it will use the IP address that's assigned to the pod effectively. 
Um, so the challenge with that is if the VM changes hosts, right? Yes, absolutely. The IP will change um, because all of the IPs are sort of localized to a particular host. Yeah. So if, if the application can tolerate an IP change, great. If not, then uh, yeah, something like a traditional connecting to a layer two network or um, I, I'm struggling to remember at you know 9.22 a.m. Eastern time. The, uh, Wait, what you're is not it? fully it's, up the speed at it's, 9 a.m.? Uh, no, I'm, I'm one and a half <laughs> cups of coffee in. Um, so, uh, so there's Mac VLAN. There's, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's several different types of networking that I assume that you'll, you'll touch on at least. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the, in the example that I'm going to show, we're going to use just a standard Linux bridge, but you're absolutely right. There are lots of different types of, uh, of, of networking attachments that we can use. You know, there's SRIOV, um, there's Open vSwitch bridge, there's Mac VLAN, uh, which, uh, you know, provided you've got supporting hardware, which is pretty much anything nowadays, um, you, you can absolutely use that. Um, so, yeah, all it really comes down to is defining that configuration so that OpenShift knows how to attach and, and, and how you want to, to, to do it. The great thing about OpenShift 4 is it leverages Maltus out of the box. So you, you're you not limited to just having one network attachment to your not only container, but now, of course, virtual machine. Um, so you can just as easily run with uh, a, a, you know the standard OpenShift SDN network, you know, pod networking, and an additional network that you'll just use directly for... Um, uh, for connectivity, or you can just use one of one of each. You know, it, it's completely flexible. Yeah, it, w- that, that's important, right? Because I can still use the pod network and define a service inside of Kubernetes to connect to that virtual machine or virtual machines, as yeah. well as provide you know that external you know data center connectivity. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, what I need to do. Um, as this is just a complete, you know, vanilla out of the box OpenShift 4.4 cluster, um, I need to set up the underlying networking interfaces on my machines. So each let one me, of my workers. Let me pause you, Reese. There's a yeah. question of what about behind a load balancer? Uh, yeah. So, so if you're behind a load balancer um, and you're just using standard, you know, OpenShift networking out of the box, it'll follow the same path as if as if it was a container. So there's no there's no difference there whatsoever. Obviously, if you're using additional networking interfaces, you know either provided by Linux Bridge or um, you know Mac VLAN or, or something that OpenShift doesn't have control over, um, then you know you'd likely need to use some kind of external load balancer as you would with you know your existing virtualization platform or refusing bare metal or, or what have you. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking of like Citrix. Citrix uh, has a certified operator to integrate with their ADCs for. Mm-hmm things like external load balancers, and that should absolutely work as expected. Yeah, absolutely right. I have no reason to believe that uh, that it wouldn't. All right, so um, what I need to do is um, I have a file here that um, I need to make some changes. So um, I know it's small right now. Let me, I'm just gonna blow that up in a second. I didn't wanna click on that. Um, so let's go into my terminal here. So um, I'm just going to say uh, nmstate.yaml. And in this file, I'm going to paste the following. So this is a node network configuration policy file. So what this does is it uses nmstate. Now you'll see that in um, in this deployment that we deploy something called the nmstate handler. And each of these machines, you know, all five, remember I've got three masters and two uh, workers, every node gets deployed this, this small pod. And this is the one that handles all of the um, the network manager configuration for the machine. So an NM state lives in the kubevert, which is the upstream name for OpenShift virtualization. It lives in that in that uh, in that upstream community, but it allows us to define what the underlying network network configuration looks like. And so what I'm doing here is uh, so we got a, it's called node network configuration policy. I give it a name, so I'm just calling it by the um, uh, exactly what I'm doing here. I'm creating a bridge, adding a particular interface to it, and it's for the workers. So we use a standard node selector. I only want to make the changes on nodes that are workers because these are the only ones that are going to run virtual machines. And they're also the only the ones that I have the additional network attached to. I have desired state, and that desired state is to create um, a Linux bridge with the name BR1. Uh, state is up. Um, 
I am not attaching an IP address to it. And this is critical. All I want to use it for is layer two connectivity. Um, if I only had one interface on this entire machine that I wanted to you know, use for also the rest of OpenShift networking as well, then I'm, then I'm obviously going to want to make sure I have uh, an IP address on that bridge. But for this, I just want to provide connectivity. Um, I don't want spanning tree. And all I want to do is I want to add this physical interface to that bridge. Now, ENP2S0 is a, you know, specific for my particular environment. Yours may be very different, but ENP2S0 is an interface that is on the layer two network that I want to attach anything I attach onto uh, BR1. So I, I want to pause for a second to talk about networking and OpenShift. Because mm -hmm. as far as I know, there's with... Uh, OpenShift virtualization, and now there's three different ways to achieve this configuration, right? Um, so if we're just talking about basic level bonds or interfaces, you could configure those when you install uh, CoreOS. Yes. So using like the Dre cut command line um, or, or the kernel parameters that are passed. Um, so you could use the network operator. And so at the cluster level, the network operator and define a CNI inside of there. Um, so I think if you if you're still connected to your CLI, it's like OC Git Network. I think is the yeah. So if you do a dash O YAML on that one, so I think in there, yeah. So in there, you would be able to define a an additional CNI network definition to create yeah. these things. And then third, and specific to OpenShift virtualization, is an M state. Absolutely. So, so ultimately, it comes down to, you know, which, which one are you most familiar with? Which one are you most comfortable with? Um, I, I think, and there's a bubbling way back in, in my head for some time has been uh, uh, helping either the documentation team or, or somebody to, here's some common networking scenarios, right, of, you know, maybe I've got four physical network adapters and I want to create, you know, one LACP bond or two yeah you know, mode one bonds or, you know, walking through those kind of common configurations. And theoretically, it should just work, right? It's rel eight underneath the covers. So it's going to mm -hmm. understand default routes. And, you know, we shouldn't have to do too much extra config. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and, you know, NM state, I, I think is, is a great way of of just expressing the desired configuration, and then it have you know go out there and, and set those configurations. I mean, LACP creating, you know, bridges. It does all of that stuff right out of the box. Um, it's certainly how I like to do it. But you're absolutely right. There are a number of different ways to achieving that uh, that configuration. Do you know off the top of your head does does CoreOS support bonds and um, and now the name escapes me. What's the other one? There's bonds and there's teams. Uh, teams. Yes, thank you. Uh, as far as I know, yeah, that there, there shouldn't be any reason why it won't. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a RHEL 8 kernel. It still has system D. It still has the, the you know, the vast majority of, uh, of libraries and tools that you would, would want. It's just, you know, stripped down. It's immutable. Um, and it, you know, it being immutable, you have to make the vast majority of configuration changes through a uh, machine comic operator and, and, and things like that. But I, I have no reason to believe why it wouldn't support... Um, bonds, teams, or, or or any other sort of link aggregation. So that's a good point. Of that, I guess that makes a fourth way to configure, um, which would be oh, machine, machine config, config operator. Yeah. Um, so where yeah. you're laying out files, you know, I have config files using MCO. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So the the good thing about M NM state um, is it will apply it immediately. Instead of um, going in there and laying out the machine, uh, laying out the you know the IF convig files and you know any additional requirements directly on the file system, because every time you do an MCO change, it needs to cycle the machines. So that so I guess a question for you. My rule of thumb has always been: if I'm going to create something using MCO, it's something that needs to be applied basically before the node is able to join the cluster. Yeah, and that, then, that's, a, that's a very good way of thinking it. Whereas this will apply it immediately and will likely then reapply it after the machine has come up. Okay. So um, what you may want to consider doing is, you know, and I need to look into this because I've never actually tested it this way, 
deploying using this to make sure it all works as expected, and then setting the configuration um, you know, so it comes up on boot through an MCO. Because I don't think that when you execute the NM state, I don't think, well, I, I know it doesn't invoke MCO because the machines stay up, they don't, they don't reboot or anything. But whether or not it, there's a way of saying, you know, making it persistent, as in saying, well, once you've enacted this, set it through an MCO so that mm -hmm. it always comes up without you having to apply it every time the machine comes up. Because, yeah, let, let me show what happens. Um, so if I do see apply, and I call it M state, I think, yeah. So it creates this new um, node network configuration. So OC get NMCP, you can say configuration is progressive. I change it to an E, which is an enactment. You'll see that it's already configured, right? So um, NMCP is the uh, policy. If you have various different policies, and then you have an, an enactment. So for each node, you have, um, you know, so that's the node name. This is the particular policy. For the three masters, obviously the selector wasn't matching, so I only want this to apply to the workers. And then you have the successfully configured for the various other ones. So if I do a OC get NNCE slash, then this one, for example, uh, oops, let's get some more data. You'll see that it has um, some, you know, successful configurations, the date and times that it would do it. And what I suspect would happen is if I was to reboot this machine, that configuration wouldn't be there. Or if it is, it'll just be there as um, you know, ephemeral. Anything I write to that file system is going to be gone when it reboots. That's just the nature of CoreOS, right? So um, to make it permanent, I'd need to look into whether there's a way of making that persistent through NM state, or whether the most appropriate way of doing it after you validated that it works through this is to do an MCO. So I, I don't know. I need to, I need to look into that. Yeah. I, I would think that if it's basic, you know, very low level networking that's required just to boot and get connected to, you know, the master, the control plane yeah. that should be done ideally at install time using kernel parameters for Drake cut. Um, and yeah. as a, a secondary option, you know, after the fact using MCO, um, and then for other networking, so enabling you know additional pod networking, uh, SRIOV, right, NM state, etc., that would be applied uh, after it's rejoined, you know, or, or connected back into the control plane. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that should be enacted. We can actually just quickly check um, SH core at um, OCP for um, worker one. Let's see an example dot com. Yes. Now remember, um, direct secure shell access is not recommended. You know, we're, we're, with OpenShift four, we really recommend that changes we, are made using MCO. But we, we frown upon SSHing into boxes. Exactly. Yes. But all I'm going to do, I'm not making changes. All I'm doing is just checking that the bridge was configured properly. So if I do IP uh, link dev uh, br one, uh, what am I doing wrong? IP link. I'll just do that to a second. Oh, there we are. Um, IP link BR1 is there, so that's fine. E IP link, uh, da, 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 where was it? IP link uh, ENP2S0 has master BR1. So we know that it's created that bridge uh, just fine for me. So now that that's happened, what I next need to do is create um, a networking definition for uh, what I want my machines to be attached onto. So if I just show you this a second, again, I'll close this. Uh, Next attach.yaml, and I'm gonna insert this file. So this is a network attachment definition. I'm just calling it tuning bridge uh, fixed, and uh, it's just a bridge network. So the idea here is this is just a standard Kubernetes network attachment definition. So this essentially tells uh, OpenShift what to do when I specify this particular network, how to attach it from a CNI perspective. So what I have here is I have a plugin called CNV Bridge. So it knows that is a particular type of bridge for CNV. Now these are a little bit different to pods. Just remember that when we launch a virtual machine um, on top of um, you know, any system, any, any Linux-based system, it is just a binary. We have to attach a, a virtual NIC into that virtual machine to get networking attachment directly through to it. 
when it's a pod, it's just a case of putting an interface into a namespace. So CNV Ridge is slightly different in that it then has to link a virtual interface inside of the virtual machine directly to the namespace. So it's slightly different, but the functionality ends up being very similar. So the difference here is now that the bridge I'm specifying is BR1, which we know exists because we created it. It knows how to do that particular um, attachment. So I'll just save that and I can apply that. Net attach. So there we go. Now our bridge is created. So that's networking for my particular environment pretty much set up. I set mm -hmm. up the underlying host configuration and I've created a new network attachment for, for attaching a virtual machine to it. And those okay. network attachment definitions are namespace specific. In other uh, words, yeah. I, I, I learned this the hard way of I, yeah, if you oh, create right. the network attached definition in one namespace, it's not accessible from other namespaces, um, which I think is a good thing because yeah. it means you can control, you know, from an administrator perspective, control what resources your projects, right? Your users have access to. Mm -hmm. That I mean, yeah, that's a good point to bring up because if you want the whole node for whatever reason, maybe it's a small node that needs access to this entire network, you need to make sure that you do it in the right, you know, yeah. everywhere namespace. Absolutely. OK, so that's storage done. Um, sorry, that's networking done. Maybe we should talk about um, storage. Now, with um, OpenShift virtualization, there's a wide variety of storage that you can integrate with. Um, you know, you can, our, of course, preferred mechanism to use would be um, OpenShift container storage. Mm -hmm. um, with OpenShift 4, the, you know, that's, that's built around um, the Ceph project. Um, so it's all deployable via an operator. Because I'm doing all of this in a sort of nested virtualization um, environment, um, I kind of run out of memory. Um, so I don't have uh, OCS running in this environment, but I do have NFS. Now, NFS is, you know, a, a really quick and dirty way of, uh, of setting up shared storage. Yeah. And so I do have um, an NFS server running inside of this environment. So I was just going to, um, going to use that um, directly. Um, so I need to set up, because I don't think that I set this up out of the box, storage classes. No, I don't have any storage classes. So I'm going to create a storage class, um, and I'm going just going to paste my YAML in here, because that's, uh, that's easier for me to do. Uh, NFS storage class, copy that, and paste that um, in. Is that it? Yeah. So all this is standard kind of storage class. Metadata name is um, NFS, and this is a no provisioner, as in I cannot set this to be a provisioner because it doesn't do any dynamic provisioning with NFS. That's one of the biggest drawbacks about using um, NFS. You have to have all of the various different PVs already pre-created. If you're utilizing something like OpenShift Container Storage, you just set it up with an operator. You spec it generates the storage class for you, and everything will be dynamic for you. You don't have to worry about you know creating volumes, uh, creating um, you know, partitions um, and, and doing all of the manual PV creation, it's all automatic for you. But NFS, it's, 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 it's cheap and easy for my, uh, for my requirements. So yeah. I'm hit so I'll, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll touch on and um, be fair to our storage partners of some of our storage partners can do dynamic NFS provisioning. I'm thinking of NetApp specifically. Um, and then there's yeah. also a, a number of storage partners who also have certified operators to consume local storage. Um, so, you know, you can take advantage of whatever resources are attached to your host if you so choose to create a shared storage pool that'll be dynamically provisioned. And then last but not least, you mentioned it earlier, which was the, uh, the host, host path provisioner. Uh, yeah. So host path provisioner is um, exactly as it implies. You provide it with a path to a local storage device. So it could be an individual disk, could be a, a local RAID device, hardware RAID device. Um, so you pass it that path, and then it will create the folders and files as necessary to provide up to whatever your pods are doing. Um, yeah. Obviously, the downfall there is, well, it's local to that node, uh, and it doesn't move around. Exactly. Yeah, that's very fair. I was just talking about NFS out of the box with, uh, with, with, with Linux. You're, you're absolutely right. Some of our partners in this area that do do NFS, like, like NetApps and, and various others, they, they can absolutely do the dynamic provisioning, as can many other hardware integration, uh, sorry, storage integration partners do all of this uh, completely dynamically. 
All right, so I've just created a really basic NFS um, storage class. Um, so I can go ahead, I need to define a, um, a new persistent volume. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this and I have uh, just a definition. I want to copy and paste here and I will again show you what this looks like. So I have one here, um, system volume type, I'm calling it NFS PV1. Um, it has various different access modes. Read write many is of course going to be very important. Um, if I want to do anything like um, live migration um, or I want to do some data import, and data import is important because if I have, for example, um, an existing disk image that I want to use, um, I'm going to need to have multiple pods being able to access that volume simultaneously. You know, I, it, uh, the, the, the import pod can attach to it, and then as soon as that's done, it can be attached into, um, into the virtual machine pod. And we'll, I'm going to show you that shortly. So capacity is 40 gigabytes. Um, that is just the size of the, the, the maximum sort of size of the volume that, uh, that, that I require. Um, its path is NFS PV1, uh, and it's on this particular server. Now, again, this is just an NFS server inside of inside of my environment. So I will um, create that. That is um, available inside of uh, my environment. But of course, it being um, available, there's no claim that I have on that uh, yet. So I'm going to create next a persistent volume claim. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting and more relevant to the CNV uh, use case. Um, I'm going to just go into uh, YAML uh, again because it's uh, a little bit easier for me to show. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to use this. So this is the PVC definition that I have. Now then, this is where we can start to add some um, Kubert annotations. So I'm creating this persistent volume claim called rel 8 nfs It uses this label, containerized data importer, with this additional annotation. So what this is doing is as soon as I create this as PV claim, it's going to look for a, 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 an available PV. Again, it has to, I had to create the PV4 because it, before because it doesn't have the dynamic provisioning with a size of 40 with a storage class name NFS. And as soon as it's found one, it's going to run something called the containerized data importer. And it's essentially going to fill the persistent volume with the data that it finds in this particular disk image. Now, this is just a rel8, you know, cloud image. You know, it can be whatever I like. It can be, you know, Linux, Windows, whatever I want it to be. And so, as soon as I hit create on this, it's going to notice that it's got um, a persistent volume that I've labeled uh, labeled containerized data importer, and it's going to pull that contents in. So let me show you that. So straight away, bound, found. We're going to persistent volumes. It has, has this particular claim. But if I then go into my uh, pods, you'll see that I now have, let me just change this namespace to default. No, let me, it's on a bridge of CNB. Where's that gone? Created. There we go. Import a rel 8 NFS. It wasn't OpenFCMB. You see that this pod has automatically been started, and this is the one that's going to start doing some of the, the data import. If I look in the not terminal, if I look in the logs, you'll see that it, it, it shows a, a percentage uh, output of it actually downloading the image from that that uh, that web that that HTTP link. It's going to resize the volume to the size of the persistent volume. So I now have inside of my environment a PV with the contents of the relate disk image. So if we go back into storage, you'll see persistent volumes. You'll see this NFS PV1. And uh, it's not currently um, in use by any additional um, yeah, owner, no owner. So nobody is actually owning that at the moment. So I'm free to use this has the contents of a relate image. So now that I've set up networking, I set up storage, now I can actually show you the creation of, uh, of a virtual machine inside of this environment. Remember, right, we started with a fresh OpenShift environment with no virtualization whatsoever. So I'm going to go into virtual machines. Now, I could do this via the YAML. I've got a definition here. But uh, I just want to show you the wizard as part of this. So I'm going to say uh, create virtual machines uh, new with the wizard. So I don't have any templates. But, you know, You can make templates uh, uh, if you want to. So um, the source of my machine. Now I can pixie boot these machines. I can point it to a URL. Now this is important. I could have done 
a little bit of what I just did with, you know, just pointing directly to that QCOW2 and it would have created the volume and, and attempted to do that all for me. Uh, a container disk image. So if you want the source to source of it to be just a container, let's run that um, ephemerally or a disk. Now I've already created the disk. I just wanted to load from that disk I, I created. So I'm just going to hit disk. Operating system. Well, this is a Red Enterprise Linux 8.1 machine. Flavor, it's going to be small. This is nested virtualization. Workload profile. So this is just a, a few additional parameters inside of libvirt. Just going to say server. So this is going to be my rel 8 uh, server dash NFS. We'll go with that. So Reese, I, I know you yeah. have a a, a strong OpenStack background. Does this, how does this equate to OpenStack? Um, because in my head, I yeah. tend to map things like if I do the source URL, that's a lot like you know creating a glance image uh, or creating a VM based off of a glance image. Um, now I fully admit that OpenStack is not my forte, so mm -hmm. I might not be using right terms here, but conceptually is that right wrong yeah you you're absolutely right so um you think of url yeah you can think of that okay that's kind of like a glance image as in use use this glance image url and build a disk image based on that disk is a bit more like cinder volumes as in i've already got the volume there just use that um, container is more sort of specific to to OpenShift and Pixie. Well, OpenShift, uh, sorry, OpenStack never really supported Pixie. Um, you know, you really had to. Um, you know, the, the easiest way of, of us doing Pixie inside of OpenStack was to attach a CD-ROM with a Pixie image. So mm -hmm. it booted up that, and, and you kind of got Pixie that way. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the difference. And then you know. Flavor. Flavor is very much an OpenStack slash, you know, public cloud type term. You know, this has some presets and you can adjust these, you know, this has some preset um, resource requests, you know, for CPU memory and various other other things. Yeah, I, I don't remember the object inside of OpenShift, inside of Kubernetes off the top of my head, but those are, you can customize those, you can create yep. new, you can remove them. Um, I think if you select the operating system as well, like if you were to choose Windows versus Linux, right, it'll customize yep. those additionally, right? It sets different it libvirt does. options. It does, yeah. And it also adds, you know, if I was to choose Windows, it changes some of these menu options as well. Um, there's some additional things that we can do with with Windows because, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, a really um, important point. This isn't just Linux on Linux. We can do Windows on top of Linux as well. Um, you know, pretty much anything that KVM can support will run just fine. Obviously, in the supported uh, uh, product, we have a, a somewhat restricted list of, of operating systems that we support for, you know, obvious supportability uh, reasons because we have to, you know, provide support SLA. But, um, but yeah, it, this is just KVM at the end of the day. You know, yeah. we're able to leverage, you know, I've been at Red Hat um, 11 years next month. And so... In that time, I've seen, yeah, I've seen, you know, Rev and OpenStack and, and all of these various different virtualization, all of the enhancements that we've made on the underlying platform, you know, the RHEL, the KVM, the Libvirt, you know, all the work we've done there around security and networking and storage, we're able to leverage all of that. With OpenShift virtualization, we're not throwing all of that away and starting from scratch. All we're doing with, with OpenShift virtualization is teaching Kubernetes and, and, of course, OpenShift how to manage those objects, how to define all of those, how to then extend Kubernetes to, 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 to give you access to those resources. So, yeah. you know, and I, it, I think OpenShift virtualization is using the same KVM that Rev is because there's, there's is. two different and KVMs. Because there's, yes, because there's KVM that ships with RHEL where the only supported guest operating system from Red Hat's perspective is RHEL. And then there's KVM with OpenStack and Rev, excuse me, and now OpenShift virtualization, which adds more RHELs as well as Windows, et cetera. So. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason behind that, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but um, you know, Red Hat has a firm commitment to never break API and ABI compatibility across the lifecycle of RHEL. What that essentially means is that if our customers deploy their application or deploy their virtual machine on top of our uh, infrastructure at, say, RHEL 8.0, it should work as expected and not require recertification throughout the entire 10-year lifecycle of RHEL. I can count on you know, 
well, I think I've only ever heard of one time where we accidentally introduced a regression that absolutely got fixed in that a customer's workload or application wasn't working as expected of that time. That is a huge commitment from an engineering perspective. You know, we're one of the only vendors that you know, really works to, to, to prioritize, you know, not introducing any changes that would, that, that, that would in, in, interrupt that. So that's, you know, that's incredibly um, in, in important for, for organizations uh, that are there. So I, what that I meant- I think it's particularly impressive with uh, Kubernetes, right? There's a lot of alpha APIs in Kubernetes and alpha yeah. kind of implies that it's going to change. So yeah. supporting those things is, uh, is, a, is big. So it sorry is. to interrupt. No, no, you're, you're absolutely fine. Please, please do. I, I certainly don't want to monopolize this. Um, so yeah, the, the, the problem with, with that is, is that, um, you know, RHEL lasts a very long time. You know, it has a 10 year life cycle. You know, customers that adopt RHEL 8 today, they have, you know, around about nine years or so worth of, of life, life cycle on, on that. It becomes more and more challenging for us to introduce new features and new hardware enablement as the operating system ages. Um, you know, because it's more and more code that we have to backport, uh, it becomes much more difficult. And we realized that this was increasingly difficult when it came to virtualization. So we wanted to both provide our same guarantee for keeping that stable API and ABI compatible on, on RHEL for the, you know, the, the QMU KVM binary, but also allow us to not break it, but be a little bit more aggressive with regards to the additional features and hardware enablement that we put into QMU and KVM and Libvirt and various different things and some of our additional products that were targeted as virtualization platforms like Rev, like OpenStack, and now, of course, like OpenShift virtualization. So we sort of created a bit of a, a, a fork. So now there's two types of QMU KVM binary that you can install on RHEL. One is just standard QMU KVM, which does have limitations, right? Just supports RHEL, and you know, I think you can only deploy like four virtual machines on it and has limitations of the amount of memory and, and you know other hardware that it that supports. Then you have QMU KVM Rev, but the binary is the same across OpenShift virtualization, OpenStack, and of course Rev, as it's sort of originally named named after. And that's where it has a lot more features. It's a lot more powerful. It's a lot more bleeding edge as it as it comes to uh, you know it, the, its capabilities and, and the code base that it that it runs on. Yeah, it's uh, and I know the engineering team puts a lot of work in into that as well. Uh, oh yeah, and as as well as working with the upstream to make sure that everything you know stays in line and works. And you know the typical Red Hats, we do everything open source and and mm -hmm. upstream. Oh. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's crack on with this wizard. So I've I've filled in these details. Um, and hit next there. So networking interfaces is, is, is the next option. So by default, it wants to put me on the pod networking. Now I could leave this, I could add an additional one, but what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna delete this because I want my machine to be directly on my bridge network. So you'll see in here, um, ba -ba -ba, type network definition, ah, sorry. Exactly what you said was gonna bite us, did. I'm in the wrong namespace. Because <laughs> I put my network definition in the default project. Let me quickly go in there and do that again. Uh, new with wizards. Uh, I'll quickly do this. Disk. This is rel 8.1. Flavor. I, I was recording a demo and was going through the same thing and spent a solid half hour banging my head on the desk. <laughs> going, why Why is it not showing up before yeah. I finally knew? Where did this thing go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. There it is. So tuning bridge fixed. Uh, the model is just VertIO. If you have any other uh, guest operating systems that don't support VertIO, then of course you can use some of the more legacy ones, but VertIO is just fine. It's just going to be a relic guest. Uh, this type is bridge. You know, you can do SROIV as well, but you know, the type of this is bridge. Mac address, I'm going to leave blank so it'll automatically generate one for me. So we go, I should only have one NIC that is attached directly to my BR1 bridge on uh, on my, my implementation. Hit next, right, disks, no disks found. Okay, I need to add a disk. Source can be blank, so I can literally just have a really, just completely blank one. I can then go in, I can specify some additional things, but I want to attach an existing disk that I have. So attach disk, it's going to say, which persistent volume claim do you want to use? Oh, did I put my, I put my PVC in the wrong one as well, didn't I? Ah. Uh, but, 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 all right, so. So I'll, I'll see if you can multitask. So what about CDs or, or ISOs, right? Can we attach ISOs to yeah, virtual like machines? Yeah, throw at this thing? It is possible, yes. Um, right, so I'm going to have to quickly do that again. Uh, 
Where's my OpenShift CNV here? Alphabet race, you know this. There we go. All right. So I don't think that I can go in here and edit this and change the namespace, can I? Let's try. Nope. Let's try. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to fail, is it? PVCs yeah. are uh, immutable after being created. OK, then. Let's try that again. Then. <laughs> always remember the project you're in. Always, always, always remember the project you're in. Yeah, location is important. It certainly is. All right, so it's also going to, um, I'm going to have to go into here, pv1, delete that. And that should allow me to reuse that directory. OK, so let me get that pv back up um, in the default namespace this time, which is good. Um, I need to do my PVC. Now then, before I do that, was my piston volume in here? That's failed because I deleted it. That's OK. So I can delete that one. So my, let's create that persistent volume again. OK. There's my PV. And I'll make sure I'm in the default project again. Yeah, now I'm in the default project. I'll create that PVC. OK, that's bound again. And we should see that pod being spawned. Yeah, OK. That's what I wanted to see earlier with me being in the default project. So that's going to re-import my data again. Let's have a look at the log file. It's the good thing about having NVMe storage. It is amazingly quick. Fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is seriously, seriously quick. Yeah. All right. So that is done. And I should, in my networking attachment definitions, I have it in the default project. My persistent volume claim is there. It's bound. OK. We should be good to go. Let's try that again. Sorry, folks. Just going to run through this quickly. Christian is complimenting your uh, semi transparent terminal window. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It, so, translucent terminal windows, like, they're, they're a gift and a curse, right? Like, if you have uh, any kind of like corrective lenses or something, I hear they give you problems and stuff. So, you kind of have to have like that nice vision but it is pretty it's very very nice yeah it's all right okay so <laughs> <laughs> managed to get back to where we were so select persistent volume claim right this is the thing now where we actually have our rel 8 nfs persistent volume claim so i can hit that this name this year is fine interface now you can be specific if you wanted to show up as you know um, sda vda or, or what have you so i'm going to go with vertio it's rel 8 again vertio is definitely the, the way forward for that hit that so it's attached that disk now don't ever forget to do boot source i want the boot source to be disk zero because remember you could have a boot source as being something else right it could be pixie or, or something else like that so i'm gonna say disk zero is my is my boot source hit next on there here you can add some additional cloud init configuration you know if you wanted to force it to be um, you know we got limited amounts of parameters we have in the ui today you can put it all in a script if you wanted to so you can expose all of the capabilities of cloud in it should you want to but i don't need to worry about that i have pre-customized this relate image with um, my root password and, and stuff so i don't have to worry about that uh, virtual hardware attach cd-rom right if you wanted to you could actually attach a cd-rom here uh, review you know Pretty simple, really. Source is a disk. It's Rel8 machine, small flavor, server profile. This is the name of the machine. I don't want to, well, this is an option I um, sort of glanced over um, earlier. Start virtual machine on creation. You don't have to do this. This is very much like what we have in Rev and, and you know some other things like OpenStack where you don't have to start it first. You can go in and make sure that it's configured everything first without just trying to start this machine up. Nick zero is my bridge network, which I call tuning bridge fixed. And my storage is my um, NFS um, disk that we created a little bit earlier. 
So in a create virtual machine, successfully create a virtual machine. So see virtual machine default uh, details. So this just like in any other snap-in inside of OpenShift is, you know, it looks exactly the same. But there are of course additional custom resource definitions that it is exposing and, and showing. You know, some additional insights into the machine um, when it's up and running. We can go into, you know, various different things about, uh, about uh, you know, uh, the actual console of the VM. I'll show you that in a second. So we go into details, events about it, you know, good use for troubleshooting, and of course, networking interfaces and disks. I'm just going to appear. I'm going to start the virtual machine. So, uh, Reese, real quick, let's yeah. let's look at the YAML um, for mm -hmm. the for the virtual machine because there's sure. a couple of things um, that that might be important, right? Of one, you can literally copy and paste this, you know, copy okay. it out and and you know, save off your virtual machine definition into your, you know, revision, source revision control system. Yep. Um, so very easy to, to recover at least VM definitions, right? Because, um, and, and you just started the virtual machine. So I think it's, um, if you do OC get VM and then OC get VMI, right? They are two different things. The VM definition versus the instantiation yep. of the virtual machine. Exactly. Exactly right. And, you know, I have, you know, I, I showed through the UI, because I think that, you know, the, the, the wizard through, uh, through the OpenShift console is pretty, is pretty cool. But, you know, you can actually do everything that I've just done through, uh, um, through the command line, um, of course. Now, um, you'll see that it's still showing no IP. The main reason here is that OpenShift um, or the, the configuration that I set with regards to the network definition is using a bridge network just as a layer two network. The VM will just DHCP um, on its own, but OpenShift ha doesn't have any IPAM control over this particular machine. What you might find is if I do that, hey, I've got an IP address now. Hey. The reason why it does that is because it has the guest agent installed in the VM. So the guest agent is able to update through, you know, OpenShift virtualization, what its IP address is, and then it'll update inside of OpenShift. So that IP address will now be shown. If I go into overview, it has IP addresses, you know, IPv4, IPv6, it's all there and, uh, you know, good to go. And it'll also be able to show you some utilization information once it, you know, once it's able to, to get some of that um, updated. Now you can go in here, you can see the console. So, you know, just like, um, you know, OpenShift, uh, sorry, OpenStack and Rev, you have direct access to the console. And, you know, this, I can get directly into this, you know, just um, fine. Um, or indeed, just to prove that networking is is working, I want to say 123.62, I can get act out directly from this machine. And also just to, you know, prove that it is actually there. 62, yeah, there we go. I'm still hung up on your eight millisecond ping to to Google, right? How'd you do that? Uh, well, I have gigabit fiber to my house. That might help. Is it Google Fiber? Or... Can you can you no, throw a rock and Google hit their fiber. data center? Right, like where <laughs> <laughs> where are you in no. location of their data center? <laughs> I think it's at Heathrow. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so that's close-ish. It shows here. Oh, no, that's going to Frankfurt. So. I don't know. Yeah, I'm. Huh? I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, jealous. I'm no kidding. Very <laughs> jealous. Yes. Yeah, we're we're very fortunate in Europe with our network connectivity. That's for sure. Mm. All right. So, um, so yeah, that machine is is up and running. Um, I don't think um, that. I automatically expand this disk. No, I don't. So by default, this flavor. Sorry, not this flavor. This. Um, QME image is just a 10 gig volume. Um, but if I was to extend that partition, I could grow this right out to the 40 gigabytes that uh, is on that um, on that NFS share that's available for me to uh, for me to use. Yeah, so the the importer pod at the very end, so it, it goes through the percentage as it imports the disk, and then there's a line in there about expanding the image. Yeah. So that that's different than the operating system actually recognizing, I, I assume if you were to do something like a uh, yeah. fdisk-l, it'll show the full capacity. It's just the partition hasn't been expanded. Yeah, there you go. So that's, so that's 40 gigs, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a 40 gigabyte disk. So yeah, I could go in here, I could... Um, no. Yeah, it's a <laughs> cloud and it'll, because I think in your image customization, if I remember you remove cloud in it, I think cloud and it'll automatically expand it, right? Yeah. Um, so now if I do... Uh, XFS. It might need to need to reboot. 
yeah, it needs a reboot. But um, yeah, it, it's still a 40 gigabyte disk. Now, how do we link all of this together? Well, um, if I do OC get pods, I now have this vert launcher. Now, this is important because remember, Kubernetes, whilst it's it's able to understand um, you know what VM objects are and you know how to associate it all and, and, and bind it all together, it still launches a pod, <laughs> right, to spawn that virtual machine. A virtual machine is just a binary, a, and that binary has you know a, a, a libvirt configuration that that defines how that binary binary comes up. So what we can do, we can do OC exec it. And we can go, I want to work on that pod and give me bash inside of that terminal, inside of that, that container. So I'm now inside of that vert launcher um, container. If I do a vert list, there's my VM, right? I can do vert dump XML1. This is the, quite fell into less. Oh, I don't have less, okay. We're just looking at it there. Um, this is the libvert definition for that particular virtual machine. So you can you can see you can see it all. It, it is literally just um, a standard QMU KVM binary. And you can see here's the QMU KVM binary that's that, that's running there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, KVM VMs are just a process and exactly. container, containers contain processes. So it, yep. it works out really well. <laughs> exactly. Yep, we're certainly not rebuilding anything from a you know a virtualization standpoint here. We're just teaching Kubernetes and OpenShift how to you know how to deploy virtual machines and, and manage them. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out that you know we can kind of geek out and dig into all these things and kind mm -hmm. of prove that yes, it's all the same, but. From a user standpoint, you know, if I'm an application team, if I'm the virtual machine administrator, I don't really care, right? You, you just showed, yeah. you know, yeah, I can use the OpenShift console if I want to, to go in and manage it just like any other virtual machine, access the console, all that other yeah. stuff. If I'm, you know, if I'm deploying things programmatically, it's just a YAML definition of what that virtual machine looks like. So yeah, and you could define, you know, as a sort of overall workload, you know, that workload could comprise of virtual machines and containers, and you could define them using, you know, almost like one push, deploy all of these resources. You know, some of them just happen to be in virtual machines, some of them are containers, and, you know, OpenShift will still do all of its its magic on, on the networking front. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I saw um, Christian made a comment about GitOps because he loves GitOps. Uh, mm -hmm. So I love it, GitOps. Everyone it, should love GitOps. <laughs> All right, let's, so let's um, just to prove something here. Uh, I'm just going to create one more PV and one more PVC, but this time uh, bah, 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 I want to paste it into here. I'll call this. Windows 2019, and I think, I think I have, let's try this, win19, win underscore 19 dot QCOW2. Now there was, um, I can import a QCOW2, but I know that there was a bug in the previous version. I don't know whether it was fixed. So let me just, um, let me just quickly fix, make sure that we're not going to run into any problems. So let's do this. Um, see about HTML, uh, QMU image convert uh, format is QCOW2, output raw, win19, win19.image. Uh, what was the command? Da, 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 da. Let me just find the syntax, QMU image convert. I was going to be impressed that you remembered all that. I have to look it up every time. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, oh. Yeah. I I don't even try to remember. Capital O. Oh, of <laughs> course. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. So then I'm just going to specify that as a raw file instead of a Qcode 2. I, think, I, I know that they were working on that back. I just can't remember where, whether it, they fixed it off the top of my head. 
Um, so, da, 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 da. so read, read, read. We should be good to go on that. All right. So that will make that a 50 gig disk. Uh, read, write many. What is that? 19. Containerized data importer should be good to go. Yeah, let's try that. All right, so that's bound instantly. That's good. Now we should see another pod running to import the Windows image. And this is slightly bigger, unfortunately. Uh, so, container creating. So while that's importing, um, I'm going to go a little bit off the reservation. And sure. do you have or, or are you able to show any of the live migration stuff? Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, I'm a little short on memory, so let me show this particular VM running just to prove to everyone that we can do Windows virtual machines as well. Um, and I'll kill one of the VMs and just live migrate one of them. The, there's a question in chat. Are those sparse raw images? Like, what kind of images are those? Um, give me image info. Um, so I'm 99% sure that ooh, my computer is going a little slow now. Um, this is just a, a, a raw file. Yeah, so this raw, is a sparse. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for You can always use um, vert sparsify as well, if needed, on the, on the disk before you upload it. Mm -hmm. And QCOW2 does work. Um, I yeah. Think oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think you were, yeah, you Absolutely. were pointing out that the Windows QCOW2, there was a, a bug or a glitch in the image that you're using. Yeah, for some reason, I think when I import it as a QCOW2, it doesn't come up. I, yeah, I can't remember I what it was. I have a new was. version Q of that out there. If you want to re-download it, I fixed that, I think. Oh, you did? That'd yes. be fantastic. Yeah, let me find you the link real quick. Actually. All right, import yeah, I've create got a short URL. Pod. All right, so I'm going to create a virtual machine. Now, here, let me check how much memory I've got on this machine. Um, 3 M. All right, oh. so we've already used all of my memory, and we're using 11 gigabytes of swap already. So we're doing Sweet. quite well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty fast machine, but all right, let's see what we can do then. Um, let's create a new machine. He with wizard, right? So do this really quickly. Uh, so this disk, it's going to be Windows 2019 um, media. Um, this is going to be <coughs> server win 19 test. We'll just start this one. I have, I have trust that it will work. Um, I'll leave this on pod networking just so you can see the pod networking and how that works. Um, I'm just going to add my disk. Uh, this is the attached disk. It is the Windows disk, Vertio. Boot disk is my the disk I just selected. Um, again, if you've got cloud in it, there is um, Windows cloud in it. So, well, I say it's support. It, 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 you, can, you can do it. There's ways and means of, of achieving that. Um, so this is cool as well. So by default with Windows, it's going to attach this um, um, Vertio Windows drivers. So if you need them, if, for example, your, machine, your virtual machine comes up and it can't access networking or, or storage or something like that, um, you can do it this way. So let's say you're setting it up via the, um, you're, you're maybe provisioning an old version of Windows that doesn't have Vertio support. It will attach this as, a, as another disk or a CD-ROM so that you can access those drivers directly from the CD-ROM um, interface. So you can install drivers so Windows setup will run. It attaches this by, uh, by default. You can, you can, of course, turn it off. All right, create virtual machine. Virtual machine is creating and it's starting this machine. Now, assuming I don't have some out of memory killers getting invoked, yeah. Assuming. <laughs> we should be good to go. We hope, yes. Yeah. There All right, goes. we have an IP address straight away, of course, because remember, this is pod networking. Consoles. Oh, there we go. Hey, look at that. It's booting. So far, so good. I mean, but let's, let's, let's look, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's realize the enormity of what we're doing here, right? Like, we are inside mm -hmm. the OpenShift cluster console yeah. with a running Windows box. Yeah, absolutely. Right, like there it is. We could log into it as admin, so forth, so on. Uh oh, maybe yeah, we can log the, into uh, it. Is this the, the one you got from me or somebody else? Uh, somebody else. Yeah. There we are. Okay. Fourth or fifth time lucky typing incorrectly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. Right, and and this is just you know. It's really smooth. Yeah. It's easy to use. Windows um, desktop in the console. is not like slow or anything. You know, no, it's just, absolutely fine. Yeah. 
despite swapping. Despite all the swapping and everything oh, yeah. else going on, yeah, right? Like, fully so, yeah, working yeah. VM. Networking, still but it's... eight millisecond. <laughs> yeah, nested virtualization. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is just using the standard pod networking now, right? right? So if I go into this virtual machine here, you'll see that um, it has just a standard you know, pod network. Um, I'm not going to be able to get access to it from here because you know it's sure. it, it's on the thing. But if I was to go to um, one of the machines that should have access to it, 10.0.2.2. No, it's on worker two, isn't it? Uh, oh, it might be a firewall not allowing it. But but either way, you know, you can access. Oh yeah, the um, Windows firewall is probably yeah. engaged. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just on a on a pod networking interface. Mm -hmm. So anything you want to do, you know, exposing that via, um, you know, a route or a service or, or, or a load balancer or whatever, you, you know, you've been doing through your normal OpenShift day-to-day -day activities, you can absolutely do that with this. You know, set the port you want to use, wherever it's listening, whether it's a database or a web server or whatever it might be, it's kind of irrelevant that it's a virtual machine. And you can administer it in, in any way that you want, right? Um, it can just be a normal VM, normal Windows VM inside of your inventory, or you know Linux VM you manage with satellite or something like that. It, it's it kind of irrelevant what uh, um, how you do it, or if you continue to use the, the same sort of stuff. Someone's you've been requesting using. that you install WSL inside that Windows box. Yeah. Uh, so and also, <laughs> also there's Pass. a uh, a question. Um, so why is that special? Referring to accessing you know Windows in OpenShift, you know, in Linux. Um, and I think you kind of just addressed that of, it's a virtualization environment in OpenShift that is just as capable of doing all of the things that you would expect from any other virtual, you know, virtualization environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one just happens to be, you know, Kubernetes based. Right, so like so, you have yeah. your Kubernetes environment and your VM environment living in the same place. Yeah. That really lowers the overhead and you know all the operational complexity the, yeah. of having disparate systems spread out you know throughout your data center. Now it's just OpenShift. Yeah. You can scale OpenShift and you can manage OpenShift. And you don't necessarily have to worry about this virtualization platform and this container platform and this hardware platform. It's the hardware and OpenShift and off you go. Yeah, Christian's making a comment about OpenShift on OpenShift of, yes, you could technically deploy CoreOS virtual machines into OpenShift virtualization and yes. either deploy distinct OpenShift clusters or if you really wanted to, definitely not supported. You could create worker nodes on your worker nodes. Sure. That would be, that would be a bit Inception-like, but... You, I mean, it's you can do technically it. possible. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just to prove a point, yeah, you 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 know, you you absolutely could. Whether it would make sense mm -hmm. to do so, I, I'm not I'm not so sure. Well, so I could see it being a potential thing where it's like, hey, everybody gets their own VM because they can just tear it down and spin it back up. But then everybody wants to like test inside that VM too. Maybe that's yeah. a potential case, right? Like, there's all kinds of ways that you can slice and dice your compute and, you know, security standards and operational standards to do whatever you need to do. And if people want like a real machine or they just need a Windows desktop for some reason, you could just spin one up for them, right? Like here's a Windows desktop, you know, you can get license, unlicensed or temporary licensed versions of Windows for testing purposes all day long. Mm -hmm. So this is a fantastic example of how you could take, you know, any kind of work environment and say, oh, you need a Windows box for testing. Here you go. And you can add that to your CI as well. Right. Like, so you can now spin up this Windows box, yeah. or run your test on the Windows box and spin it back down. As exactly Christian right. points out in chat, you could spin up Windows to test the Edge browser for your app. <laughs> there right? you go. Like that's a yeah, fantastic that's, example. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, and and also if you've got, um, if you know, if you're just using pod networking, then obviously every pod can contact every other pod on the cluster, so you don't have to worry about well, you know, I need to get my, you know, VM that's running wherever, 
you know, connecting through, it, it's just there already. So, right. yeah. All right, so I'm going to delete this Windows virtual machine because I think we've proven that that works. And there we go, it's gone. Um, so um, let's look at doing some live migration, shall we? Um, just yes. to prove that it does work. So remember, you have to be doing this on something that has shared storage for obvious reasons. Key reason. Um, yeah. <laughs> there is Spe some... Specifically um, RWX. Correct. PV, right? right. Correct. Read, it has write. to be a read, write, many. Um, uh, PVC, yeah. Now, um, there are there is some work ongoing to do live block copy, as in not using shared storage. As in, you want to do live migration, it'll do the copying of the bits, and eventually, when it gets to a point where it's transferred all of the bits, uh, and it can do a you know an immediate switch over, you're good to go. Um, you know, obviously, if the rate of data change is higher than you know network bandwidth or what have you, it'll never migrate. That's kind of there's no way we can stop that easily. Um, uh, but yeah, this is just on shared storage. So in theory, um, you know, you can there's an, there's an object you can create. Um, there's an object that you can create, like a really simple. Where is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba. The, the most simple um, object here you can create, which looks like like this. Virtual machine instance migration is a custom resource type. So it's a migration job, you know, it can, it can be whatever you want it to be. And you specify the name of the VMI that you want to change, you want to move, you know, relate server NFS. Or you can just go in here and do it through the UI. So, so you know, Reese, if you create that object, the one that you just defined, mm -hmm. basically that just requests rescheduling through the Kubernetes scheduler? Yes, um, but it will ensure that it doesn't land on the same machine. Okay, but you're you basically you're not saying you're not saying go to this host. You're just saying go to any other host and reschedule to any other node. El yeah. Eligible host, of course. Right, right, but right. It, any, but it won't it won't turn this one off and start it on another one. It will do a yeah, proper yeah. live migration. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, I mean, we can we can do it through this if you if you want. Um, no, I, I'm just highlighting no, yeah, that yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. have yeah. to. You don't have to say go from host A to host D. You can say just leave host A. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely, yes. Um, there is a way um, you can expand on the definition, and you can specify the destination host. Um, so I'm just going to keep pinging that so we can see that it works. Let's say migrate. Uh, yeah, migrate. Yeah, so it's migrating. You see on the background is worker two. And if everything's set up nicely and everything works. If you hover over that. Now it's worker oh, one. It's and you'll see that there was just the five millisecond. Yeah. So that's now running on worker one. Um, so we can just verify OC debug node OCP for worker one dot example dot com. I love this OCD bug, by the way. You know, anywhere that you've got a route to the um, the server itself, uh, sorry, to, to the OpenShift API, you're good to go. Um, there you go. There's my VM. Uh, Relate server, NFS on worker one. So we know that it migrated just fine. And that machine shouldn't have even noticed that it was, was migrated. Still up. Same IP address. Good to go. So live migration works. Um, you can also do um, a node maintenance. Um, so if you want to, you know, take down a machine, you want to drain it of all of its pods. Um, but the, you know, the critical thing here is you do it through Kubert so that it doesn't just terminate the pods like it typically would if you wanted to drain a drain a node. It'll actually migrate the virtual machine first. Um, I, think, so I know we've already, and that's in the VM definition, right? I think that's the migration strategy or something like that. Yes, but you can also, yeah, you absolutely can do that. Um, but there's also um, you can just specify, um, you know, the maintenance. So I'll, I'll quickly show you this. Um, let me just copy that. Um, so 
So there's so a this, yeah. uh, there's a question about live migration with SRIOV devices and whether or not that works. I don't believe we have that capability today um, because we've only just got those sorts of capabilities with um, OpenStack. Um, so as with everything, you know, the base underlying infrastructure will support that type of capability, but um, it's about ensuring that we can also do it through OpenShift virtualization. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we, 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 can, we can absolutely find out. Okay. So real quick, node maintenance, which I see in the API is a <laughs> kubevert uh, uh, CRD. Yeah. How is node maintenance different than, for example, cordoning a node? Um, mm. As I understand it, this is going to ensure that the migration happens first. Okay. Um, well, we can kind of verify. Um, let me just check the definition of this. What have we got here? Um, ba -ba -ba. Running true. I don't know whether it has any fiction or yeah. So let, let's let's try. Let's let's see what happens. So it's running on worker one. Um, I've got uh, node maintenance here, which is just worker one maintenance. Node name is this particular one. Let's work one maintenance. So C get nodes. I have those. O C apply dash f uh, this file. And then in a few seconds, yeah, scheduling disabled on that worker. Yeah, there we go. It'll migrate that workload directly back onto. If you hover two. over that migrating, does it give a status or click on it maybe? Might happen a bit too quickly. I was wondering that earlier. <laughs> Let's just check this um, running virtual machines. Well, it's running on worker two now. <laughs> so, so it already happened, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Again, this uh, these even though they're, they're virtual machines, this is a. Uh, I, well, I I spoiled myself to a new uh, new machine relatively recently, and so it's uh it, it's, it's it's pretty quick. You you deserve it, Reese. <laughs> well, I I really. My, you know, my previous machine I had for about eight years as my you know daily driver. Oh. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I build them just to last. Yeah. And so you know, this one is is is, is particularly nice. Um, uh, da, 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 what do I do? Uh, PSA scrap. But uh, ooh, no. Can you KVM? You see, yeah. There's there's the binary which is on. This is now on node two. So we know that it that it moved. And again. Yeah, so, and, and real quick to highlight, so when you do a node debug, you're logging in as more or less as root to the host. And as um, root on the yes. host, you can see and access all of the processes on that host, even though Correct. this QEMU, QEMU KVM process is running inside of a container. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I could have gone into the, the container, but I just wanted to prove that I'm on that particular host. And the mm -hmm. binary is running there because yeah. I could connect into the the pod, but the pod doesn't necessarily show me which host it's actually on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's node maintenance, live migration. Um, I don't know what what does any everyone else want to see? Um, we can we can start doing some host path stuff if that's of of interest. I, I would be interested. Yeah, if Andrew's interested, I am. <laughs> All right, no worries. Um, so let me... Uh, ba -ba -ba. I can get rid of this machine now, I think. We can always build a new one um, for it. Okay, um, so we need to um, host path. So the first thing we need to do is we need to... Um, now I'll upload this up in a second. Uh, MCO.yaml. Oops. So this is a little bit bigger. 
so this is a machine convict. The reason why you have to do machine convict is because we need to create directories on the underlying host because it's using local storage. Now with host path, we are literally using a path on the underlying file system of our worker nodes to store those disk images. So we're no longer using NFS or anything like that. Now you can do, you know, data migration between, you know, if you've already got a host path and you want to move it to NFS or back and forth, you can absolutely do that. And you can absolutely, you know, move between various other, you know, non-local storage should, should you want to. Um, so we're going to apply a machine convig um, to these to these to these machines, and we're just going to add a new system D file. This is going to do um, two things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to make a new directory on the root file system called um, you know slash var slash hp volumes. Then it's going to relabel it so that uh, we don't have any um, SD Linux issues. And this is going to come up and it's going to set it um, uh, to to run uh, up on um, system boot. So you can go see apply-fmco.yaml. So my machines are now going to reboot. <coughs> Enable that again for schedulable. Um, but, but, but. Uh, let me go into vert manager. Uh, OCP4 worker one. And OCP4 worker two. And we'll just let those two wait a minute. I know they're small, but I just want to see those rebooting as the MCO is applied. It might I'm take assuming, a minute I'm assuming you could go into the, the uh, machine config uh, section of the yeah, of the administrator and see it applying. So yep, yeah, there's your there's your file. And I think if you look at uh, machine config pools, it'll show that it's been, yeah, if you were uh, to look updating, at... Updating true. Yeah, there yep. we go. So it is, it is applying those, and we should see the reboot relatively quickly. All right, whilst that's doing that, let's have a look at some of the other files that we're going to apply pretty quickly um, in a minute. Um, so the first thing we do is we apply the uh, the MCO. Um, once we've applied the MCO, we need to apply uh, the configuration of the host path provisioner. So it's just the, the resource definition for that. And I'll show you that. Um, MC, oh no, HPCR.yaml. So this is basically going to do this. Um, we're going to create um, ba, 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 host path um, uh, provisioner. There's the kind of host path provisioner and the path convig. So we're telling it to use um, var HP volumes. We might have lost that because, uh, yeah, there we go. It's because our nodes have been rebooted. And I have a very small cluster, and my routers are running on my workers. Or uh, so. out of memory hardware. Or indeed out of memory. I mean, one, 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 yeah. one of the two. Yeah, I think that's the pod disruption budget. I think mm, because it's yeah. because it's a small cluster, it doesn't exceed the disruption budget to mm -hmm. to reboot both nodes at the same time. Yeah, it'll just go ahead and do those. It. Uh... Um. B -b -b yeah, pending. That's okay. Pending is okay. Grep dash b dash i running. Yeah, so you have a bunch of pods that are pending, waiting to come back up. Yeah. Yeah, that's just OpenShift and Kubernetes recovering services after a node reboot. Pretty pretty standard. Yeah, pr pr pretty aggressive node reboots where I've got a very, very small cluster and I have no I have no regard for uh, <laughs> my services staying up. It's like in the early days of virtualization when network admins hadn't quite caught on that you know, IP storage means you can't take the network down. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll just yeah. reboot the router. It's just a couple of drop packets. The apps yeah. will be fine. No big deal. Yeah, there's a lot of pending pods at the moment. Uh, oh, yeah, we were looking at some of those files. So, yeah, then I'm going to have to apply that custom resource definition. Um, then I need to create the... 
the actual storage class for HostPath. And this actually has the, the big difference here is we have a, um, uh, this is a PSC. Um, this actually has a dynamic provisioner, right? So we can actually say, um, uh, uh, yeah, this is actually a, a provisioner, has a provision type called host path um, provisioner, new storage class. So we'll create that. And uh, what else do we have then? And then when we're ready, we can just create um, a PVC. And I'll just create all these files so we're ready to go. Again, we can, of course, do all of this via the UI as well. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to create another VM based on Relate. We're going to call it Relate Host Path. I'm just going to run the same containerized data import as it pulls that Relate image um, directly for us. But of course, we specify the storage class name as Host Path um, Provisioner um, as well. Uh, this. Uh... Seems to be taking its time to apply the to apply that MCO. I'm sure it doesn't help that your your physical host is swapping. Uh, yeah, that's very true. Let's see. Uh, yes, yeah, so we used all the memory. And 14 gigs of swap now. It's almost as much as in my laptop right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know that we're uh, getting towards our our time here. We only got about 20 minutes left. Um, were there any other questions whilst we wait for this to to invoke that we want yeah, to? Any go other through? questions from chat? Any questions from you know out there in viewer land that you want answered? Right, like when did we release this? This is tech preview, right? Yeah. Uh, so originally, originally three tech preview. ten or three eleven, right? I think. And then now it is GA and four four. No. Um, no. Tech so preview it is and four four. It is still tech preview. Um, we do expect it to GA this year, though. Right. Hmm. Um, so you can do, I think at the very beginning, we talked about doing emulation versus mm -hmm. nested virtual virtualization. Um, mm -hmm. Both work. Um, emulation, of course, you're going to have a even more substantial performance penalty. Um, and yeah. I think, if I remember correctly, with the operator, it's as simple as when you initially deployed, changing that false to a true. Um, or is there still, a, you still have to create a config map. I don't remember. Yeah, you do. So. Um... Before we had the operator install, um, you had to run a deployment script that would, you know, deploy um, deploy all the bits you needed. And yeah, you could set a parameter there, which is KVM underscore emulation. Um, and you know, that's that that works just fine for you know just doing a little bit of testing. But you know, the performance is is is, is pretty bad. Um, certainly, would you never use it for uh, for, for production? Um, but you know, so long as you have a relatively modern machine, you can enable nested virtualization just just fine. Um, you know, yeah. even by default, I think on, you know, libvirt, it's, it's, you know, it enables it by default when you, especially when you do copy, um, you know, host CPU model, um, it'll pull through the, the nested virtualizations. You can do it there. All that node label a pod is, it, you know, wants to see is that it has dev KVM available. If it has dev KVM available, it knows that it'll, it'll work just fine. Yeah. And there it doesn't ways... care if it's first level or second level. Right. Absolutely. It doesn't. It doesn't. So the, there's a question in chat. Um, so does GA mean it's open source slash free? Um, not uh, not sure how licensing works. So I, I, I'll I'll let you um, answer that one, Reese, because uh, sure. it's it's the you know the normal value of an open sh or a Red Hat subscription stuff, right? Sure. So um, everything that Red Hat does is open source, and we have a very um, you know 
of what you know part of our mantra is absolutely upstream first so we always develop all of our new features security fixes enhancements whatever they are they always go into the community first um so everything that you saw here um is available today um it is um you know it's all based on open source i've deployed the red hat supported um operator but there is an equivalent upstream project called Kuvert. yeah yeah exactly community called called Kuvert. um but what you saw today is technology preview you know you can install it we provide all of the bits um you know uh, with and alongside openshift um so you can try it out it's just not fully supported we can't provide our standard support level agreement for it so if you raise an issue a bug you know we'll do our best to you know help you with it we'll never put the phone down on any customer ever um, but there's obviously a limit to what we can actually do in terms of being able to uh, um, to, to, to support that. You know, we, we we provide it with no sort of guarantees that it's going to work just yet. Yeah. So, and, and and to be clear, right, GA Tech Preview or none of the above doesn't change the licensing of whether it's open source or not. Doesn't change. Yeah. It, it it sort of changes depending on whether or not you want to use supported versus not supported. Kind of the location that you're getting it from, right? Mm -hmm. As in, yeah. if you're getting completely upstream in the case of OpenShift virtualization, you're really using the Kubevert project. If you're using the preview, i.e. unsupported or not supported yet version, you get it from Red Hat as tech preview. And then when it goes GA, you get it from Red Hat. But the difference being we will fully support it at that point. Duck Hunt. Yeah. Duck Hunt is uh, just the the app that I was just showing to um, prove that the the OpenShift cluster was running. It's just a really basic game that I deploy just to um, it validate like a, clusters up and running. It sounds like a great way to to waste some time. Yeah, like yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so my team does a lot of uh, enablement. You know, it, that's internal training for our technical resources, but we also do a lot of um, you know labs at Red Hat Summit and various other uh, conferences and so we try and make it a little bit more fun once the, you know the um you know the attendee of one of our lab sessions has um you know got their cluster up and running you know how do you prove it and i refuse to go down the path of deploying wordpress or something mm. you know like mm -hmm. that that's the most boring thing in the world if i can get a game running and the way that I deploy this game, you know, we do a proper source to image, you know, it downloads the code from Git repo, builds it using, you know, standard, you know, OpenShift build pipelines, spits it out into the internal registry, deploys it in a pod, scales it out, attaches a root to it, and you expose, you know, you expose it and you can use it through the, you know, the ingress. That's using almost, you know, all of the features of OpenShift right there to run a game. So, you know, it, it's pretty cool. It's all based on, on open source stuff and it just, I don't know. It, it's just a bit more, you know, entertaining when you're when you're running a lab or a demo or something like that. I mean, doing the the uh, uh, WordPress install isn't entertaining. You know. uh, well, uh, when was the last time you installed it? I mean, they make it really easy. I, I, I'm not knocking uh, the WordPress yeah. install <laughs> no. at all. It's, it's just really a base, easy, but... it, it's it's an overused like example. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 So there's a, a question, does OpenShift Vert slash Kubevert make any use of the Libvert APIs? Absolutely, it does. Yeah, so yes. that goes back to what I was saying earlier. We're leveraging all of the work that we've put into virtualization on, on Linux for you know the past uh, at least 10 or 11 years that I've been at Red Hat. So all of that engineering, all of that effort is, is literally being reused. So we call libvert to instantiate that virtual machine. So when I was doing the debugging earlier on that, uh, on that, on that virtual machine to show you like behind the scenes, I was using Versh. you know, we dumped the libvert XML. If you joined a little bit later, you know, go back into the, the recording when it's available after the stream, you can mm -hmm. see us go into that, you know, it's just using libvert underneath the covers. It's using libvert, it's using QME KVM. It's using everything from RHEL that you typically use in a, in a virtualization environment. You know, the, the, the big difference is that it's orchestrated using Kubernetes and not, you know, OpenStack or Rev or, you know, just standard, uh, you know, vert manager tools that I, you know, you're seeing here only because I've got a nested um, environment. I, I think that's important to point out, right? Because even with Rev and OpenStack, KVM is the hypervisor. KVM is the yeah. part that's actually executing the virtual machines. All of the other bits and pieces on top are really focused around two things, right? One is getting the resources that those virtual machines need available 
to whatever host it may be using. So storage network, et cetera. And then two, actually scheduling it. So whatever policies you put in place of, you know, I want high availability, I want anti-affinity, I want, you know, X and Y and Z. So using the scheduler to actually make that decision. But at the core, it's still just KVM. It's the same hypervisor. It's we're just changing the management plane, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So did we did we break your your host? Yeah, I th I, I think it, I ran out. Of, I think I ran out of memory. <laughs> like, is yeah. it truly dead? <laughs> I believe so. I mean, we could uh, we could try and troubleshoot some of this if uh, if we like, but I mean, this is this is not how anyone would really run OpenShift in reality. So I've uh, I've right. really pushed the boundaries of not only the product but also this system. So uh, yeah, I think something may have fallen over somewhere. That happens when you're doing it, doing it live, doing it live. Oh yeah, live demos. Absolutely. So I don't. Uh, so a lot of things, a lot of things are pending. Um, so let me get, let me clean this up. Um, for I in OC get pods uh, dash a grep dash v dash i running no grep completed. Print. Yeah, see, no, no, that's the. You know, normally my rule of thumb is never do arithmetic in public. I might have to add bash scripting to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, unless it's copy pasta. Yeah. So these failed in. Yes, yeah, so it's just the revision pruner. Okay, let's see. Get hard slash A, grab dash V. Okay. So these are all the ones that are, and I can now add dash v running. So these are all of the ones that are not wanting to come back up for some reason. And I suspect it's because so Help me with the syntax. If I want to look into the machine config, it's uh, and I've got the mm, like MCO or yeah. like which config? Uh, is it MCO? No. Uh, if I just yeah, want I to look at the it's M machine config pool, I think M it might be MCP. Yeah, there we are. Oh, okay. So it still says it's updating. Hmm. If you can pull the, you might be able to look at the nodes and see if. They might be suffering from an out of memory condition. Hello, I wouldn't expect that. Oh, the VMs no... themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, can I run if, debug? If, if home like killer is rapidly killing off things, right? Like this is going to get degraded real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is like this machine's barely using anything, but that's just virtual memory at this point. My machine, you know, the physical, may uh, may not be liking things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could take some drastic action if we want to actually see this host path stuff come up, but I realize you've also got about 10 minutes left before the stream's meant to end. Yeah, I, I think it's fine. Um, I think, you know, conceptually what happens and you walk through this already um, is the machine config that was created is specifically for SE Linux um, because it's rel eight. Or yep. let me rephrase that. It's Core OS, but Core OS is built on Rel 8, which means that all of the normal features like uh, uh, SE Linux are there. So we have to take that into account when we want to use local storage, i.e. storage from a local physical storage device um, to host virtual machine disks. So 
that was the genesis for all of this with the machine config operator was to do that SE Linux relabeling to allow it to happen. Yeah. Um, theoretically, once the nodes come back up, we just use the host path provisioner uh, in order to define, right? So one, we deploy it. Two, we define that it is a storage class. And then three, you simply start creating PVCs using that storage class and it will result in folders and files being automatically created um, on that, whatever the path specified in the host path provisioner configuration um, for the PVs. And those PVs don't have to be used with virtual machines either. They can be used for anything. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. The, the host path provisioner is, is certainly not virtual machine specific, but we simply utilize it to host our virtual machine disk images. And, and uh, you know, the beauty of having a provisioner is, you know, it does all of that dynamically. You say, I want this claim, you know, this size, um, you know, you can uh, attach some annotations to it. You know, they could be covert annotations, right? Pull this, pull this disk image into, into that volume automatically for me and I'll go away and create all the PVs and, and do everything dynamically for you. That's, that's really powerful. And how is host path provisioner different than like an empty dir definition? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it has something to do with the persistency, but I'm probably not the best person to ask there. I know that you know there's, there's some big difference between the local storage operator, which is um, you know slightly you know that's that doesn't have dynamic provisioning, but the, the beauty of local storage is you can use entire block devices instead of just a file system location. But yeah. uh, empty empty DR is is you know, it's kind of a, a little bit more of a, a hack, I would say, in that um, it's just, you know, use this kind of scratch space. So I, I and I think the answer to that question is, um, because I was trying not to answer or ask you a question that I didn't maybe already know, um, which is if you create an empty dir, um, essentially you are using the standard graph storage, right? Of, so what is it, varlib volumes, where, wherever it normally stores, um, the ephemeral data for container image layers. Whereas mm -hmm. with host path, host path provisioner, I can have a completely separate storage device. Maybe I attach or I have some uh, physical devices in a local RAID array or something like that, right? I can, I can use that as and specify that as my path or as my location mm -hmm. for those um, volumes to get created. Yeah, so I I forcefully rebooted those two workers to see if the MCO had actually run, but it it just hasn't run them yet. So um, yeah, something's getting stuck it, in my particular environment. But, yeah. but as you say, this would never happen on a you know proper deployment because right. I I just haven't set up you know those those particular thresholds. It just it was more than happy to take down both of my workers where the majority of the you know the infrastructure pods were also running yeah. to keep this thing up and running. Right. And so uh, yeah. I might have got myself a little bit stuck here. Well, I think that's fine. I think you are, you've done an, a phenomenal job of showing us all the ins and outs of virtualization so far. And, you know, the fact that your home rig is falling over is completely, <laughs> completely understandable, you know, <laughs> right? Like, I totally get it. Um, you know, Andrew pointed out, yeah, the, earlier this week that, you know, Things are very possible on home labs, but you're going to have certain limitations, and here's one. Absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, Run, running out of memory when you. Yeah. yeah, like if you don't have the hundreds of gigs of memory that you need. Yeah. Yeah. So just go ahead and file an expense report for you know a small data center. I'm I'm sure oh, it'll yeah. be fine. My manager would love that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, I don't think we're going to recover from this. So not in five minutes. No, I suspect not. we probably. Well, I, I, I know for sure that we we could recover from this, but uh, I'm it, not it sure people really want to see that happen yeah. in the next five minutes. But we we so. do have a very important question in in the chat though, which okay. is why isn't Reese wearing a red shirt? That is, I know that is very. I, I didn't question. get the memo. <laughs> I have a red shirt. I could change, but uh, no, no thanks. <laughs> Not that kind of not on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so it's funny, right? I think I have one company branded red shirt. Most yeah, of them are black same. with the with the red right. red hats. Um, 
so yeah, it, it's funny that despite red hat, um, very few of our shirts are red. Yeah, it's funny. My wife was like, so I'm terrible at dressing myself, right? Like I spent too long in the military. <laughs> so I, I like I'm, I had a new pair of pants and I was like, so they're blue. Can like I wear what color can I wear? And she's like, oh, light gray. And I look at all the red hat shirts and I'm like, well, there's one. <laughs> it's the volunteer one I got. That's it. Like a light gray or a red. There we go. So, yeah. All right. With that. I think we're done here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Reese. Appreciate you your time. Anytime. Uh, coming up on the schedule later today, we are having a OpenShift Commons multi uh, simulcast, I guess that you call it, uh, you know, multi-stream. Uh, OpenShift Commons will be doing a session with Andrew Clay Schaefer, the, the DevOps uh, luminary that he is, uh, talking about, you know, transforming... Um, you know, your environments, your work environments, your systems, the way things work in your company. So join us today at noon for that, that simulcast and uh, tomorrow at two o'clock Eastern. I'm sorry, I don't have, oh, no, I do have UTC timing on. It is 1800 UTC. Uh, there will be some deploying of OpenShift on bare metal happening. So check that out. Eric will be running that one tomorrow while I am off doing other things for uh, behind the scenes work for the stream itself. So, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful day, evening, night, week, weekend, the whole nine yards. Reese, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, without any further ado, I will send us out. <laughs>